Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be building a small form factor, low powered, completely silent desktop PC. Now I've been wanting to do this on my channel for a while, but I haven't come across the correct CPU motherboard combo until now. And this thing is going to be absolutely amazing for getting your work done, schoolwork, light image editing. You could turn this into an HTPC because it will do 4K and 5K video playback really well. Or one of the main things I use these smaller low powered PCs for, emulation. So let's start it with the case here. I actually picked this up on Amazon for $30. It's an RGeek HTCP case and was designed to house a mini ITX board with a Pico power supply. Now the main bread and butter of this whole build is the all new ASRock J5040 ITX. This is an ITX size motherboard that uses SODIMM RAM, but it has a CPU pre-installed given it's a non-upgradable CPU, but this is actually using the Intel Pentium J5040. It has a TDP of 10 watts, four core up to 3.2 gigahertz and built-in Intel UHD 605 graphics. Now I will admit these are a bit hard to come by. Uh, I've got a couple notifications that they were in stock and as soon as I went back they were sold out but I was able to pick this up on Amazon for $149. So we've got the motherboard and the CPU covered with the J5040 ITX but we still need storage, RAM, and a power supply. So for storage I opted for a 500 gigabyte PNY SSD. It's a CS900. For RAM, I'm going with 8 gigs of Ripsaw 2400 megahertz SODIMM RAM, and my power supply is actually a 150 watt Pico. And we're going to draw nowhere close to that, but these are cheap, I've used them in the past, and they work great. I've had really good luck with them. And in order to get power from the wall to the Pico power supply, you will need a 12 volt power supply. And this is rated at 5 amps, so it'll do a total of 60 watts, but I don't think this whole build's going to pull over 30 at full boat, so you could go with a lower end power supply if you wanted to. And by the way, the case that I chose will do two 2.5 inch SSDs or one 2.5 inch and one 3.5 inch full size drive. So you have storage options here. But unfortunately, the J5040 ITX doesn't support an M.2 SSD. I actually didn't even think about that when I was purchasing it. But as soon as I got a hold of it, I started looking around the board and noticed it didn't have any M.2 storage options on the board itself. But there is an M.2 slot for a Wi-Fi module if you want to add one. Now to be perfectly clear, I'm not expecting this thing to be a super high performance machine, but it will outperform any single board computer that I've ever tested. It's going to be small, it's going to be completely silent, and it's going to be a very low power option. So let's get right into the build. This should be pretty simple actually. First thing we need to do is install the RAM. We don't have to mess around with the heatsink on the CPU or the CPU itself because it's all pre-installed right out of the box on the J5040. This uses SODIMM RAM, and I opted for 8 gigabytes of 2400 megahertz RAM. We're just going to install this in both of the SODIMM slots, so this will be running in dual channel mode. And that's it. We now have the RAM installed. It's time to put the motherboard inside of the case. So with this RGeek case, there's really not much to it. We have our power button on the front here, ventilation on both sides, and two extra USB 3.0 ports. Now this was a cheaper case coming in at $29.99. It's made out of aluminum and it's 3.5 millimeters thick. I really do think it was worth it. It's a pretty decent case for 30 bucks. So as you can see, we do have the hard drive bracket on the top. We can mount two 2.5 inch SSDs or mechanical drives or one 2.5 and one 3.5 full size. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this bracketing system. And once we have that out of the way, we actually have a lot of room in this case for a mini ITX build. First thing we need to do is install the rear I.O. plate for the motherboard. It's just going to snap right in here. And you might notice there's some larger holes towards the top of this case, and that's where our Pico power supply power input is going to go. It uses a little screw system. And when I install this, I'm just going to put it over on the right hand side here. Now we can go ahead and install the motherboard. I'm just going to grab it by the heatsink here. Make sure everything's lined up with the I.O. plate on the rear. And hopefully, since this is a cheaper case, everything lines up. And it actually looks pretty good. All four screws on the motherboard are lined up on the inside. And it's looking pretty good here. Now I just need to secure the motherboard inside of the case with the four screws. All of that does come with this RGeek case. Now it's time to install the power supply. I'm using 150 watt Pico, and this plugs right into the 24 pin connector on the motherboard. And this power supply that I have here actually has an extra four pin connector for CPU power, but the motherboard that we're using in this build doesn't utilize that. So I'm just gonna kinda zip tie everything together and keep it out of the way. 
Now, if you're good with a soldering iron, you can always go ahead and modify something like this and just completely remove it. But I'm just going to set it up with some zip ties and I think we'll have enough room in this case. And don't forget to install the ground wire. It'll actually go on one of the motherboard mounting screws. So I've just plugged it into the 24 pin connector on the motherboard and this is going to serve power to everything in this PC. And just to keep those extra wires out of the way, I just kind of zip tied it up. All I have is that single SATA connector to go to my SSD. And as for getting power to the Pico power supply, I've installed it in the rear here. It comes with that mounting nut. I've just tightened it down here. And this is where my 12 volt 5 amp power supply is going to plug into the whole unit. And really, the last thing to do here is mount this SSD, get everything plugged in, and install Windows. So this is the top mounting bracket here. It also has those USB 3.0 ports attached to it. This will hold two 2.5 inch drives, or one 2.5 inch drive and one 3.5 inch drive. And there's actually several different locations on this mounting bracket to mount these 2.5 inch drives. I'm just going to go on the right hand side here. And it's possible that I will have to rearrange this drive to get everything to fit in here correctly, but uh, this is about it. All I need to do is finish this drive installation, throw the top on it, and install Windows. So yeah, I ended up flipping this drive to the side here just to make it a little easier to plug everything in, and overall I think it went together really well. And once I've thrown the top on it, it looks a little something like this. It's a sleek little case, and for 30 bucks, I think it's well worth it if you're looking to build a silent HTPC or even a little emulation PC with something like this. We have those two extra USB 3.0 ports on the side, and if we take a look at the rear I.O., we have two more USB 3.0 ports and two USB 2.0 ports. And for my use case scenario, that's plenty of I.O. Okay, so here we are. I've installed Windows 10 Pro. Everything went super smoothly. I've installed a bunch of applications. As you can see, we have that Pentium Silver J5040, 8 gigs of DDR4 RAM running at 2400 megahertz, and the built-in UHD 605 graphics. Now, as for using this PC as a PC, it works really well. I'm going to go ahead and launch a browser here, and we're just going to head over to YouTube. We're going to check out some 4K video playback. So we're sitting right at 4K, one drop frame, not bad at all. Let me go ahead and go forward a bit here. Buffers out really quick. Picture looks nice, still only one drop frame. So we're going to take this up to 5K because this video is actually 5K capable. And we'll go full screen. Got a couple drop frames here and there, but that's something you'll never notice. I mean, 11 out of 1,000 is pretty decent for a low-end chip like this. So 4K video streaming on a setup like this will work really, really well. Next up, we'll keep the theme of 4K video streaming, and we'll use Plex. So right here, we have a 4K video, 60 FPS, 60 megabits per second. I'm just going to resume it from here. Go full screen. And it should work out pretty decently. An excellent video playback from Plex, and this is streaming from one of my good friend's servers. 60 FPS, 60 megabits per second, and I kind of expected this out of a chip like this. Even the lower end J4125 does a great job with 4K and 5K video playback. Next thing I wanted to do was run a couple simple benchmarks. Here we have Geekbench 5, Single Core 513, Multi 1799. Now recently I did a review on the Larkbox Pro, which has the J4125, and that scored a 453 Single Core and a 1576 Multi. So we are much higher here on both of these scores with the J5040, and I suspected that would be the case because we do have a higher CPU clock on all four cores. The next benchmark I ran was 3D Mark Night Raid, total score 2806, definitely not the highest that I've seen, but this is a low end chip here. I still want to get into a little bit of gaming and see what this is capable of. Here we have the Windows version of Minecraft. I have fancy graphics on and I've actually upped it to 42 chunks. And as you can see, I do have Afterburner running up in the top right hand corner, we're at a constant 60, so Minecraft on a setup like this is going to give you no issues at all.
Next up, we have the original version of Skyrim. I'm at 720p, medium settings, and I was really hoping we could pull off a constant 60 with medium settings here. But unfortunately, it looks like you will have to drop this down to low to keep that 60 FPS frame rate. I mean, this is playable in my opinion, but some people might just want this to run at a constant 60, so low settings is going to be the choice. Next up, we have CSGO, low settings, 720p. Unfortunately, I can't get Afterburner to run on top of the game anymore, but it is going in the background. So I enabled the Steam overlay. The FPS is up in the top left-hand corner. And by the end of my run here, I had an average of 48 FPS. Moving over to some emulation, here we have Dreamcast using the ReDream emulator upscaled to 2560 by 1920. You're not going to have any issues playing Dreamcast games on this device. As long as the game is compatible with the ReDream emulator, it's going to run it at full speed, even upscale. PSP is another one that runs really well on this little setup. I'm using PPSSPP at 4x resolution, Vulcan back end, this is need for speed most wanted, and we're running at full speed. Tekken 6 is another one that's a bit harder to emulate. I'd say this is a mid-range game. We're still at 4x with that Vulcan back end and getting full speed. So far, PSP has been performing great on this little build. And finally, we have Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition. Now this is a harder one to run, and I did have to drop it down from 4X to 3X, but we're still using that Vulcan back end. And at 3X, I still think it looks great, and we're running at 60. I went through and tested a little bit of 3DS using the Citra emulator. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough power here to push it. This relies heavily on OpenGL and a really powerful CPU. And as you can see here, it's trying its hardest, but it just can't hit 60. Even with a game like Mario Kart 7, it's still struggling. So we didn't have great luck with 3DS, but when it comes to GameCube, using the Dolphin emulator, this little thing is trucking through. I'm using the Vulcan back end. This is Mortal Kombat Deception and we're running at full speed. Next up, we have 1080 Avalanche. Same thing here, Vulcan back in, full speed. and it even handled one of the harder games that I like to test on one of the harder tracks, Auto Modalista. So yeah, this little thing does handle GameCube really well for what it is. So going into this, I wanted a completely silent, low power draw PC, and that's exactly what I have here. I have a kilowatt meter plugged into the wall. This is total system power draw. At idle, we average 8.4 watts, 4K video playback, 13.4, 720p gaming using CSGO, 24.7 watts, and the maximum that I could get this thing to pull from the wall was 33.4 watts, and that's an extreme test. I was running Time Spy and Cinebench R20 at the same time. So everything was maxed out on this tiny build, and you'll never see power draw like this under normal use. So yeah, I think the build came out pretty good. I was hoping for a little better performance out of this J5040, but I really can't ask for much. I understand that this is a low-end chip, but I got what I wanted. No noise, low power draw PC that can do emulation, light gaming, school, work, 4K, 5K video playback, 
It does exactly what a normal Windows PC is supposed to do, and I think it does really well, especially given that at idle we're only drawing 8 watts, and for a maximum, I mean a total maximum of 33 watts out of the wall. So there are a few other things that I'd like to test out on this board, but this video is drawn out long enough. I will have one more video coming up. I think we're going to test Linux and a few other applications that I missed in this video, so if there's anything you want to see running on this build, just let me know in the comments below. And if you're interested in putting a build like this together, I will leave links for everything I used in the description. But like always, thanks for watching.